Well, hello, everybody. This is uh, Krishna Vadula here again uh, from India, representing um, GEDC, IFIS, and uh, IUCE. Welcome again to one of our uh, webinars, most one of the most popular webinar series, I think, in the world, actually. Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are, different parts of the world. It is my pleasure to have this amazing panel in front of me. They're from all over the world. They're from Paris, Scotland, Ghana, South Africa, and I'm located in India. And we've got a couple of people behind the scenes from the United States and other parts of the world. So thank you so much. This is really exciting. We'll be talking some great, uh, interesting things here. And uh, and I will first thing I will do is introduce the the person who is going to be the uh, the moderator for this panel discussion. Uh, the lead person here is Monica Holly Collins. She's a, she's a researcher and lecturer at Institute Mines Telecom Business School uh, in in uh, in near Paris. Uh, currently, uh, and uh, and he there she acts as the deputy director of a research team, which focuses on the social engagement and impact of universities, the future of higher education, and university business cooperation and its role in regional innovation. She and her team manage over 10 European Commission funded projects with a total value of over 6 million euros, as well as a strategic partnership in the era of digitization, SEED program at, at IM, IMTBS. Previously, she has worked at two international organizations in Paris, France, the OECD and the UNESCO, as well as working as consultant with Petrus since 2014. So it's a real pleasure to introduce you uh, Monica, and uh, just hand hand over the the mic to you now. Take it over. Take it away. Thank you very much, Krishna. Um, very happy to be here today, everyone, for the fourth uh, webinar in our GDC Industry Forum webinar series. Um, today's topic, as you know, is societal impact. And um, the previous three have been on skills and talent, educational transformation, and discovery and innovation. Um, very happy to be speaking about societal impact today with our panelists. Um, we're going to start off today as just with uh, some brief introductions from our panelists. We have Dr. Tokozani Madrozi, the Dean of Engineering at Wits University, Chair of the South Africa Engineering Dean Forum, Kozo Korkotsi, Foundation Manager at Shared Interest Foundation, and Drew McFarlane, Rankings Manager QS, leading the development of the QS World Rankings on Sustainability. So I will ask each of our panelists just to give a brief introduction of themselves and their interest in today's topic. Uh, let's start with you, uh, uh, Toko. Yes, thank you very much, Monica. My name is Toko Zani Majosi. Uh, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment at Red University in South Africa. I'm also a professor of chemical and metallurgical engineering in the same university. So that's basically who I am. I've been working a lot on methods of uh, sustainability. My area of expertise is process systems engineering. So we looked at uh, the sustainable design of chemical operations in particular. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, what about you, Kota? Tell us a bit more about yourself. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Uh, my name is Kojo Kokochi. Uh, I am based in Accra, Ghana, in the West African region. And I am the foundation manager at Shared Interest Foundation. And I'm responsible for monitoring, evaluation, and learning, uh, as well as the lead for the social accounting process at Shared Interest. So, Shared Interest Foundation is an international development charity located in the northeast of England. And our Shared Interest Foundation, we develop and deliver technical assistance programs to support smallholder producer groups to build strong, resilient, and sustainable businesses. So over the past few years, we have been working with universities in Africa and Latin America to develop climate smart and eco-friendly technologies uh, aimed at addressing uh, some critical societal challenges and issues um, that are facing smallholder producers. So uh, we recently currently have projects in seven countries, five in Africa and two in Latin America. So I am happy to be here to contribute to the discussion on societal impacts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy to have you here. And Drew, please tell us more about yourself. Thanks, Monica. Hi, everyone. My name is Drew McFarlane. 
So I'm the rankings manager at QS. I think QS is the sort of largest higher education insights company in the world. We're famous or infamous for our rankings. Uh, my background, I'm a social scientist by training, so I'm among an unfamiliar audience today with all of you engineers. Um, uh, I was a psychologist by training and I lectured for a few years before joining QS. And um, I think why I'm here today, most recently I was um, part of the design team for our sustainability ranking, which we just launched uh, this month. Thanks. Thank you, Drew. Um, so, again, thank you all for being here. Our topic today, as I mentioned, is societal impact. Um, face, uh, given the global challenges that we're facing today, it's increasingly important that we are educating uh, future engineers to be able to tackle these challenges. Employers are increasingly interested as well in hiring graduates with sustainability skills, for example, in the workplace. And students are showing a growing interest in the topic. I recently came across some statistics on this um, from a global survey carried out in 2020 by the um, Students Organizing for Sustainability International. 92% uh, of respondents uh, globally, so these are young people, uh, teenager, teenagers to early 20s, I believe, and 92% of the respondents agreed that sustainable development should be universally taught and promoted by colleges and universities. 85% um, agreed that they would like to learn more about sustainable development, and 73% agreed that it should be actively incorporated into and promoted by all courses. So just to give a little perspective about what we're dealing with today, but um, it is still quite a broad topic, so I'd like to help um, narrow it down so we can um, focus on a few of the uh, uh, different aspects that I mentioned today. Um, I, first, I would first like to ask uh, you, Toko, what does societal impact for university look like from your perspective? Well, um, it takes a number of dimensions. Um, there is a societal impact that would look at the curriculum reform, for example, where we look at how we prepare our undergrads and graduate students before they finish varsity, so that uh, by the time they go to their societies, they are well equipped with their knowledge to contribute to the So there is that part which talks to the knowledge that we give to students at university. But there's another part that say, how do we as academics interact directly with the societies that we seek to serve in solving some of their problems? And particularly with us, uh, given where I am in South Africa, South Africa is one of the driest countries in the world. So water in particular has come up as one of those very, very key areas of engagement with our societies, both in terms of conserving water, but also making sure that we provide clean water in one way or another. And of course, water and energy go together. It is always that nexus. So it's always a two-pronged approach. Uh, the first one is saying, how do we make sure that our students are well equipped to choose once they are at university? And then making sure that we go directly to the societies that we serve as a university in solving some of their direct problems uh, pertinent to sustainability. Great, thank you. So there was a there's a bit of an echo when you speak, but just so just to recap for everyone to make sure that we've all understood you correctly. Um, you're saying that uh, essentially it's a two pronged approach for you. So you have you want to equip students for um, for tackling societal issues when they graduate, but also um, academics and the university itself can go directly. Uh, can work directly with society on these issues. Is is that is that more? I'm sorry about the sound, by the way. No, no, it's no, it's okay. I, I, what I might do just to make sure that we're all on the same page is try and um, repeat what I've understood, and we can we can uh, manage like that. Um, that's really interesting. So, so I think it would be useful to give the audience some concrete examples. Um, of what this might look like. So I'm going to ask um, you again, Toko, and also Kozo, if you could begin. Could you give us um, any concrete examples of what 
this might look like. So student involvement um, in societal issues or institutional involvement or academic involvement. And Kote, we'll start with you, thank you. Okay, so for example, in, um, in, uh, in the curriculum, we have introduced courses that talk directly to water conservation or water management. And these are accredited courses by our accreditation bodies. Uh, it's something new in our curriculum because in the past, these are issues that a student would only meet after graduation. Uh, an opportunity like that was not with their study say to not available in the past during their undergraduate training. Uh, can you hear me? It we got about I think half of what you said. Would you mind repeating um re repeating that and let's see if it if it picks up? Yes, so oh. I, I'm saying that um, a typical example what we've done at an undergraduate level. I'm not sure if that improves the audibility, just removing the video. But a typical example of uh, talking directly to undergraduate students is changing the curriculum or modifying the curriculum such that we enrich it with some of sustainability topics. One of them being water and of course the other one, very foremost, being energy. So we introduced this in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in an undergraduate program these programs, by the way, are accredited fully by some of our accreditation bodies. And uh, we also have projects, whilst the student is at an undergraduate level, where they work with some of the communities in our vicinity within the project. And that project, of course, ends the student some marks as part of their curriculum development. So that's one example. In another example, some of our prototypes that we developed in-house, like your memory infiltration systems, for example, we take to communities where we work with them directly in solving some of their water issues. For example, cleaning their groundwater and making sure that that water is ready for consumption. So these are some of the typical examples on the issues of sustainability. Great, thank you. Yeah, we can hear you much better now, thank you. And um, Kojo, would you uh, be able to give us some concrete examples as well? Yeah, thank you, Monica. Uh, I want to give two quick examples, one in Peru and one in uh, Ghana. So starting with the uh, example from Peru, we work with the National University Toribio Rodriguez de Mendoza uh, to develop a biological method for controlling pests and diseases in coffee. In the northern jungle of Peru, is actually the home for many coffee producers. In 2020, the region has known a high incidence of uh, coffee borer disease, which is a pest that will attack 50 to 100 percent of commercial coffee production. So you will understand that when they lose their coffee, they lose their income, then it impacts directly their livelihood. So together with the university, we thought of working together to create an environmentally friendly and eco-friendly method for controlling the pests so that we can improve coffee production and improve the income of the people living in that region. So we first of all worked together to develop a um, fungicide which was based on a fungi known as Boveria bassia. So this fungi was developed in laboratory and propagated and it is a very environmental friendly uh, method for controlling the coffee borer disease. So coffee farmers normally resorted to the use of agrochemicals, which threaten biodiversity conservation, impoverish the soil, and even undermine uh, organic coffee production. But looking at the environment, we developed together with the university this method for controlling the coffee borer disease. And in 2021, the income of many producers has improved because yield has gone up and we have also contributed to the conservation of the environment. So that was one example of working with the university to develop technologies that could support people living in community to address the critical issues that are facing or confronting them. Another 
one year was in Ghana, where we worked with the Science Department of University of Ghana to develop a technology known as hydroponics. This came from an observation that we made that in the northern part of Ghana, access to land is a big problem. Climate change remains a bigger challenge for people. Meanwhile, agriculture is the mainstay of the people living in that region. So they are unable to grow crops, but they needed really to have those crops produced in order to respond to their basic needs in terms of feeding. So we developed a technology that we call soilless farming or hydroponics, which enabled the farmer to use locally available materials to grow their crops outside the soil. And this actually technology requires a small land space, so addresses the issue of access to land, which is a problem in the community. And secondly, it requires more amount of water, and you could produce all type of crops all year round, irrespective of the climate situation. So the development of that technology was based on a need assessment at the society or at the community level. So we understood what the problem was and how do we address it to improve the livelihood of the people in that community. So with this technology that we have developed, many people in the country have embraced it and are able to grow crops all year round, and they are now addressing the problem of food security in the region. So this is another example of our work with the universities to improve uh, societal impact in a sustainable manner. Thank you. That's great. Thank you both for those very uh, interesting and relevant um, examples. And I hope that helps um, the audience uh, understand a bit more uh, what we're addressing uh, with the topic of societal impact. It, it, as I mentioned, it can be quite broad. Um, Drew, I'd like to bring you in here um, because you are involved in the new sustainability ranking that QS has developed. Would you speak a bit about that and how it relates to the examples that we've just heard? Sure. Um, before that, I think I would just make the point um, that rankings, whether you like them or not, have had demonstrable impact on higher education. So I'm, I'm going to think back to when I was a child. I'm sure my parents wanted me to do well in exams for the exam's sake. I wanted to do well in the exams to get presents. And if there's people in the audience today who have kids, they might relate to this bribery. So QS give ranks. Any rankings agency give ranks to people. Those are presents for hard work. And what we saw 20 years ago was lots of institutions, particularly in developing parts of the world with very poor research footprints, very poor rates of international and uh, internationalization, poor rates of um, sort of reputation and collaboration. And when we put those front and center in our ranking and said, if you would like to be ranked, you will need to demonstrate performance in these, these, in these areas. Over the last 20 years, we've seen massive improvements from countries like Malaysia, China, um, um, Eastern Europe's come up quite a bit as well um, and of course they probably would have done that naturally over time but rankings has certainly helped light a fire under um, institutions to do that. So bringing that to sustainability we want to try and have a similar impact on institutions in sustainability as we've had with things like research impact reputation and collaboration. Um, so we brought the ranking to market this year, and it's a decidedly outwards focused ranking. So if you think of the missions of a university, research, teaching and engagement, we thought, how, how can those missions translate into making a difference to, to the world in the environmental sustainable development goals of the UN's 17 SDGs and the social um, sustainable development goals of those UN SDGs? So we're looking at, for example, are you equipping students with the relevant curriculum and skills to go out into the world? And, and Taco made that point in, 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 his, in his first example, you know, making sure that we're equipping students to be um, not, not just equipped, but actually to lead the conversation in sustainable development. So we'll be rewarding universities for having relevant curriculum. We're also looking at their performance in certain subjects that are very aligned with sustainable concerns so earth and environmental sciences earth and marine sciences 
um, um, looking whether they've got climate uh, master's programs, green energy programs, uh, to make sure that the quality of that education is good. And we can also track that from research metrics as well. It, uh, you know, if there's great citation impact um, for, from these subjects, and I think engineering is actually a fantastic example. Across the SDGs that the UN are tracking, many of them would be solved by engineers. I think no, no doubt about it. So the research impact of that. We're also looking at um, research collaborations between Global North and Global South, and that's where we might be particularly interesting for this audience. I think you'll all know that um, it's been a struggle for, for um, Africa to get a strong research footprint when you compare it to, to other regions of the world. So what we've decided to look at is if institutions in the Global South, in, in, indeed much of Africa, are managing to have fruitful research collaborations with institutions in the Global North, that's sort of fantastic for bringing up academic standards. Um, you know, bringing the sort of skills, the knowledge and the facilities from those more developed institutions and sharing them with the institutions in the African region so that they can you know, do all these fantastic programs like the ones Kodzo was talking about. But that's only really gonna happen with cross-border research collaborations um, and sharing. So that's a big part of, of the ranking as well. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Drew. Um, uh, Kaja, I'd like to ask you, so in, in your role, you, you mentioned that you um, do some kind of assessment yourself in your role. Um, how, how do you go about that and are there any commonalities with anything that, that Drew just discussed? Yeah, thank you once again, yes. Uh, in fact, impact evaluation uh, needs to be aligned to certain key criteria. So generally in evaluating impacts, we look at the effectiveness of the intervention or the technology. So this should be part of the design of the technology and the learning process even for engineering. When you are developing a technology, there are key questions that you need to ask yourself. In the first place, how effective it is? That is, is it able to achieve the objective because a technology is developed to achieve an objective? So after developing the technology, is the objective that was outlined achieved? How efficient is the technology? How cost effective is it? And how affordable it is to the users of that technology is also a criteria to be taken into consideration. Because these things come to the fore when it comes to the evaluation of that technology and how it impacts society. We also look at relevance of the technology. A, is it the technology doing the right thing, what is actually destined to do? And what difference is the technology making? So that is the relevance, then we look at the impacts. What difference is that technology making on society? Then we look at coherence. Is the technology really a good fit? Does it really respond to the needs of the people? Does it really address the critical problem that were identified be before the conceptualization of that technology? And finally, the issue of sustainability. How sustainable is that technology? How sustainable uh, are, will the benefit of that technology be? So when you go to the field to do an impact evaluation or look at evaluation of the impact you have produced, these are the criteria that normally we use. So we look at the intervention, the, disco the, the discovery, the innovation, and then we go ahead to ask these critical questions to see whether those areas have been fully covered by the technology and has it really created the impacts that we wanted. So there are a number of interventions that we have implemented in, the, in some countries. So we go to the field. Yes, of course, we sat down and then you have access to the technology, but you realize that technology is not really environmentally sustainable or it doesn't really address the intended need of the people because it wasn't part of the conceptualization or the design of the technology itself. So when it happened that way, then you realize that yes, of course, a lot of time, resources, energy have gone into the learning process, the design process, and at the end of the day, it becomes a failure on the ground. That is why it is critical that these criteria are addressed during the training of engineers and innovators 
so that they are taken into account because when it comes to evaluation, these are the same criteria that we are going to use to ascertain whether it's been effective, impactful, sustainable, relevant, or coherent. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you. So you're speaking about the evaluation of the particular programs that you are working with um, in collaboration with universities, correct? Yeah, that's correct. How do you choose the universities that you work with? Is there is there some kind of metric that you look at or or for for example, would a would a ranking such as the, the sustainability ranking that Drew is a part of be helpful? Um, in choosing the universities that you collaborate with? Yeah, in choosing the university that we collaborate with, first of all, we look at the understanding and the program of that university in relation to the type of technology we really want to develop or implement to help people in communities. So if a university has really marketed itself of having skills in a specific area that is of interest to our program intervention, then we feel it's a good fit for us. So we develop a kind of partnership with that university so that we can explore and see how they could support our programs. And we also encourage using local universities because they also live in the local community, understand the needs of the people and have already have some level of engagement with the people in that community. So the local knowledge is also very important in designing uh, technologies and interventions. So we do take that also into account. And also we look at uh, the willingness or some past uh, performance of the university in certain areas and see whether it aligns very well with our mission and vision. Then we begin to develop that level of partnership. Thank you. Um, Toko, I'd like to ask you now, um, We've begun talking about how uh, universities are chosen for different collaborations. Um, I was wondering what you think about, uh, what your opinion is on the uh, importance in terms of visibility and impact of, of uh, rankings or different assessments um, and how that might be useful in, in choosing universities um, to collaborate with on these social impact um, projects? Yes, um, uh, thanks, Monica. The, the, the rankings for sustainability in particular, and many other rankings that we have, are very, very, very important. Uh, one of the reasons why that is important, we students, when they decide in most instances which universities they go for, they tend to look at these rankings very carefully. So the rankings are very important. Um, and I think it's very much along the lines of what Drew said, whether you like it or not, the rankings are important. Uh, it's, a, it's an issue that we've debated at length as to which of the rankings do we go for? Are the sustainability rankings necessary for us? And there's a resonating uh, position that um, the sustainability rankings in particular are very, very important. VET, as you would know, my university ranks very, very highly uh, and I think in Africa, perhaps we could be the highest in that regard. We took a decision to subscribe to sustainability rankings and we work a lot on sustainability issues. I would have said perhaps, or maybe mentioned at some point to you, Monica, that we are arguably the only university, at least in South Africa, which has a pro vice chancellor that looks at climate, inequality and sustainability just to pronounce our interest and dedication of focus on issues of climate, on issues of uh, sustainability. So for us, rankings are very important to attract students. But besides that, rankings tell us that we are hitting hard where it matters most. So basically they give us an indication of uh, where we sit in the broader scheme of SDG goals, for example. So where do we sit mm -hmm. in that scheme? And how are we doing in that regard so that we can, of course, monitor our performance as we, as we go forward. We also use these rankings also to look for partners, not just in Africa, but also outside Africa, because we know there are many, many colleagues or many institutions, uh, both academia and private, that work in such in these areas, including the research council. So we use these rankings to look at who out there is working in these areas 
who is doing well in these areas and then who to collaborate with along the lines of course of complementarity of uh, skill or synergies so so the rankings are very very important for us. thank you um drew i see you nodding a lot would you like to uh, make any comments on what uh, toko has just said um well yeah i think there's a couple of points that was interesting one um the importance to students i think uh, with, with Gen Z now, if it, this, you know, I guess uh, kids in their sort of early teens to, to early 20s, something like that, that generation are so well known around the world for being the activist generation. Um, they, they, they protest brands where brands are seen to not be socially conscious. They, they protest if there's environmental issues that big brands, oil companies or things are, are, are not taking seriously. But actually on university campuses, we're seeing that as well. I know of a very local example where students boycotted an entire course because the, um, the instructor demanded in-paper assessments and the student says, no, we're not, we're not going to print this out. It's completely ridiculous. We'll email you the assessment. And there's this real battle between old ways of working and, and new ways of working. So these Gen Z students are the ones going to the world's universities right now. So they're going expecting universities to be making a difference. And if rankings agencies are, are showing the performance, I think they're, they're going to be taking that quite, quite seriously. It was also really just um, encouraging to, to hear Toko talk about using rankings to sort of help make partnerships. You know, not every university can be Harvard with billions of dollars of an endowment and can do everything in-house. A lot of universities, maybe most around the world, have to collaborate. They have to share facilities, share expertise and research. And if rankings is one way of helping them to do that and strategize, fantastic. Mm, great, thank you, Drew. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit here because uh, something that has been mentioned a couple of times now is um, sustainability skills and developing those in students. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about that and how specifically um, curriculum can be developed to help um, really you know, de develop these skills in students and, and then send them out as graduates um, where they're able to make an impact in society. And I'd also like to hear how that might come into the rankings that you've developed, Drew. But first, I'll, I'll ask um, um, Toko, um, because I know we've spoken a bit about it before, but um, in your opinion, what kinds of uh, curriculum does your university uh, implement to develop these kinds of sustainability skills? Yes, indeed. Um, Monica, the best way of uh, inculcating this kind of knowledge is through projects. So it is very much project-based in most instances, where we have a living, say, from industry or from the communities that we serve. It's a living example. For example, here we, we have textile industries. We work with the textile industries. We work with the uh, with the pulp and paper industries. We also work with some of the food and beverage industries. These are water and energy intensive industries. So they are the ones who, for example, give a problem to us, which is then given to a student. So a professor works with the student, mainly undergraduate students, and that way they learn by actually doing how to reduce uh, the of reduce water in this instance or reduce energy but it also as they do so this inculcates the thinking at a, at a very very end of taking sustainability issues into account now when we ask our students to say uh, design a, a plant we're talking about chemical engineers for example because we've got a number of caps, capstone projects in our final year one of the assessment criteria is how well they took sustainability measures into account. So when you design a plan from scratch, to what extent does it, uh, it reduce the amount of water that it uses? To what extent does it reduce its energy footprint? And we assess students based on that. So at a very early stage, they understand that, that it must be very much an inherent part of their thinking in everything that they do, that they uh, reduce uh, our hours, conserve our resources. So this is the best way of doing it uh, so far. And we've found that to be working very well because we do get feedback from our industrial partners where these students are employed. 
who give us very good feedback in that regard, that when they get into industry, they tend to hit the ground running in as far as that is concerned. Great, thank you so much. Um, really interesting. So, uh, and Kajal, based um, in your experience working with universities on these different projects, uh, you work with student teams as well, correct? Yeah, so uh, when we develop projects, uh, there are students that come from internship. And so they have practical uh, uh, hands on what they do. So uh, it's been uh, very helpful. So there have been a collaboration between our projects and also universities. So they do send their students to come and see the actual demonstration of what we are doing on the ground. So it's also an opportunity for them uh, to do research and also ask questions which uh, at the end of the day help them in their research work or when they are writing their proposal so there have been that collaboration between our some of our projects and uh, student bodies mm -hmm. and what has your experience been working with some of these uh, uh so you're working with these students as interns have you how have you have you been had the opportunity to work with them after you finished these projects with you and how might have you noticed a difference between uh, graduates who have worked on these projects and graduates who these kinds of projects and graduates who haven't in terms of the skills needed for these uh, social impact projects? Uh, Monica, you broke a bit. Can you reword the question again? Uh, apologies. So I was just curious. Um, so you said that you work with students um, mainly as interns and and uh, in these in ways like uh, these kinds of ways in the projects that you work on. I was wondering if you, I assume that you've gotten to work with some of them after they've graduated, and I'm curious if you've noticed uh, a difference in um, the way that these students approach societal impact and sustainability versus maybe graduates who haven't worked on these kinds of projects yeah to be honest we haven't really followed them probably after graduation to see how they are approaching uh, impact or how they do tackle societal problems uh, really maybe uh, this is an area that we also need to look at critically going forward uh, probably for uh, us to be looking at pro uh, students who have had internship on our project how after graduation where do they find themselves? How are they approaching development issues? And what contribution are they making to society? Might also mm. be an interesting area to look at maybe going forward. Definitely. And um, that leads me to you, Drew. So uh, speaking about these sustainability skills, how might these, are these incorporated in, in your ranking? Um, and if so, how? Well, it's interesting. We almost have this sort of opposite um, challenge to, to, to Kodzo there, who, you know, we don't track what's happening live at universities. It's very difficult. We sort of infer performance from much later outcomes. So to give a few examples, one of the things we look at in, in the sustainability ranking is people who've made it onto successful alumni lists, cl climate activist lists, social, uh, social change makers, uh, green entrepreneurs. That's that's the end result. And then we infer from that that if they got onto these successful lists, the university must have done a pretty good job in instilling skills and knowledge into them. Uh, and we do the same for, for lots of other things. You, um, you know, we look at citations, that's the outcome of research that was done years ago. I think, yeah, it will be a, a challenge for us in rankings, but a challenge we should take up of, of actually looking at what's happening on the ground now. It's a huge resource effort to do that though. A university tells us that they're embedding sustainability into the curriculum. Do we have to read the curriculum? Are we going to go through their course materials and, 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 and sort of vet that and score it? You do that for you know one university, sure. Do that for 3000, that's another issue entirely. Um, so there's a lot of you know having to take things at face value, but um, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting one for us. So we do ask universities, you know, do you have curriculum on this? Do you have research centres on this? Um, or is it embedded? I think embedding is really really important. Like, you know, when I was at university and studied linguistics, that's all I all I studied. They didn't teach me anything about sustainability or about business skills or any you know, anything. 
So embedding is important. But how do how do we prove that universities are doing that? That's that's a challenge. Indeed. Um, I have, so speaking of so, I think we've established that um, that rankings do have an impact and are important to. Uh, for students and for universities when they're looking for different partners, um, as Tokel mentioned. Um, I'm wondering, so the examples that we've had today, several of them from, from Africa, um, are both for uh, two of our panelists are based in Africa. And I'm, I'm wondering, so in the rankings, it's um, often there is a, a focus on um, certain geographical areas, and I'm wondering um, how might universities in Africa, for example, who are doing really important work on sustainability, um, how might they be more, uh, get more involved in your ranking drew um i toko mentioned for example that they have a pro vice chancellor on climate would that be something that would be flagged in your ranking and and um essentially what what can what can these universities do who may not show up in their rankings even though that they they do have a lot of um of these kinds of projects what can they do to 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 increase visibility yeah, a good and, and, and challenging question for those universities is a bit of a chicken and egg problem. So it's not that rankings focus in any particular region. We focus on things that we've deemed to be important to higher education, research being a huge one of them. So regions that naturally do well in research end up being regions well represented in rankings, but nobody sets out to, to, you know, to rank a majority of North American or European institutions. They just happen to do a lot um, more and more impactful research. The sustainability ranking, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to take a, a very decidedly outwards focus. So if the university is really helping to change the world socially or environmentally, that should be visible, pretty obvious to anybody who wants to look visibly visible globally in your alumni, in your research, in your reputation. So it's, I don't think I'm going to lie or sugarcoat it, it would be a challenge for a smaller university doing more niche work, more community-based work to get into a ranking like that. But there are so many other avenues for those institutions to shine, uh, whether through national accreditation systems, through a rating system, um, possibly a little bit further down the road, once we get a little bit more expert ourselves in this area, we might start to do branched rankings that you know we have regional rankings at qs at asia ranking and arab ranking perhaps we start to do sub rankings of sustainability that focus more on those community engagement things or those learning and teaching objectives but at the moment it is decidedly a sort of global impact flavored ranking and um, with research at the heart of it so without a strong research footprint it's going to be a challenge so re start with research and you know hire the best faculty you can make sure you're driving a strong research agenda at your university collaborate 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 boost your citations mm -hmm. that's my practical advice but um none of that's easy indeed thank you um following up on the collaborate 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 the emphasis on uh, collaboration which i'm sure we all agree is important um I'd like to focus now on a specific type of uh, collaboration, and that is with employers and the the, um, the community. So, Toko, I'd first like to ask you, what's been your experience working with um, industry employers more broadly, um, and uh, on this particular issue, sustainability and social impact more broadly? Yes, um, the experience has been very, very positive because it is usually premised on mutual benefits. So there is a lot that uh, university gains out of this, mainly through funding, but that's not really the driver behind this. But the knowledge that is generated by the universities is of direct use by industry. So there is that mutual benefit. In my opinion, that is at the heart of the success that we've had. 
having a mutually beneficial kind of a relationship where the knowledge that we generate at a university actually has immediate and observable um, outcomes in industry. So the industries then become our laboratory of some kind in real life. But as I said, it's not just the industry, we also go directly to our societies. Our thinking is we've gone beyond what you'd call in the past the trihelix era, where it was industry, government, and academia. We also have to include in that society. So we have an avenue to go directly to industries, work with industries, and of course those industries indirectly impact society, but we also go directly to societies and measure this. But I've found that these relationships tend to work best where all parties involved benefit. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, and Kato, in your experience, what has been, um, how have you seen, how, what's your view on the uh, importance of collaboration between the universities that you've worked with and the, lo the local uh, industry and employers more broadly? Yeah, what I will say is that uh, collaboration between universities, society and industry is actually fundamental to the training and growth of students as well as in the development of curriculum that will really fix the needs of society. So uh, we are training people who will be able to function effectively in society. So I just feel that it is important that in the design even of our curriculum in the first place, need to even start from society because curriculum must be need-based because such a curriculum is training people who should be functional within the society. And it is there that we can talk really about impact. And these people who are um, after graduation, these students who go to the industry are working to promote the cause of society in the first place. They are working to uh, ad advance women development. So this uh, uh, collaboration needs to be strengthened right from the development of the curriculum through the teaching pedagogy and down to the impact assessment. Um, that I, would be the I had to interrupt, I think we need to uh, get to the audience, audience for, for a few questions. I think yes. Christian has Thank you. questions from the audience. Christian, you want to yes, read I, them out? Or? I've got one from Neil that I'll begin with, um, who asks on the rankings issue, how might universities that are greenwashing be separated from those that are genuinely making a difference? Um, and I'll start with you, Drew, on that one. Uh, thanks, Monica. Yeah, it, it, it's an ov obvious problem um, that we're aware of. Com companies are doing it all around the world been watching and certainly universities are going to do it too. What, uh, one thing I would note is, you know, our ranking is not just environmental focus, 50% of it is on those uh, social SDGs, you know, gender equality, uh, equal opportunities, um, peace, justice and, and, and opportunities. A part of it, like any ranking, is hoping that universities are truthful. They're, they're not always truthful. We try our best to validate their data. Um, we, we use independent sources to verify it. We use government databases to try and verify data. But a lot of this data is very frontier stuff. Universities have just started recording their ESG uh, emissions. Companies have been doing it for years. And um, accounting standards agencies have very rigorous definitions of what they will allow for things like scope one and scope two emissions. Um, I should be familiar to the, to the engineers in the room. Universities don't have a regulatory body globally, so it, 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 I would just say my short answer to that is it's a concern. We're not quite sure how to deal with that yet. Great. Yes, I, understandably. Um, and um, I would like to ask one more question of the audience, um, an audience member, Elsie. Um, she says, it's a truism that what matters to a society is what measures, metrics, and rankings tell that tale. To the extent that society is coming to appreciate the unintended consequences of siloed sustainability impacts on systemic well-being, e.g. on the living system, on environmental justice, on equitable health outcomes, example, for example, to what extent is whole system mindset a priority for academia and for the design of metrics and rankings? And I know, Toko, this was an interest of yours. So 
perhaps I'll, I'll let you answer that question. Indeed, yeah, I, I like the question actually because fundamental in the adoption of uh, these sustainability rankings, at least for us, it was really talking to our adopted position as an institution that we break the silos completely across various disciplines humanities science engineering um, and there is no avenue no better avenue at this stage that we've identified than sustainability to or sustainability issues but also you can add to that things like ai or fourth industrial revolution but yeah fourth industrial revolution but in as far as this discussion is concerned sustainability came up very strongly as an avenue for breaking the silos so at the heart of uh, of what we are doing is really that of uh, having all disciplines on the same wavelength great thank you so much um I had one last question for Drew. I don't see him. I'm not sure if we've lost him or not. I think we have. Okay, well, um, oh, no, you're back. Okay, just um, one final question from um, the audience. Um, and just very briefly, Drew, how can this community, our audience members, how can um, how can this community help them improve their approach to be as relevant as, and inclusive as possible? How how can this community improve their approach to be as as what sorry as inclusive as possible? So how can yeah how can um, the community the so the audience members how can they um, how can they improve their approach to be as relevant as and, and inclusive as possible? Um, given what you what you your experience at QS and in these rankings? Sure, I would follow um, what Toko said. Don't silo things. Don't silo your engineering curriculums away from a, a lot of the broader societal um, concerns. Um, and then I would say, you know, in, engage with rankings agencies. Of course, I'm going to say that, but we want to learn from experts, um, such as this kind of audience. Um, there's lots of things we're learning as we go along with, with respect to like how to measure emissions and what sort of standards and accreditations exist out there that we might want to lean on to improve our work. So you can by helping us to improve our work, we'll, you know, we'll help back into that conversation. I don't think I've got um, any more really, I don't think it's for rankings yeah. companies to tell engineers how to improve their Sure. Their and uh, just as a, a last, um, last, last thing here to wrap up, um, same question, but to you, uh, Drew, uh, QS, how, how can QS uh, then, um, improve their approach to be as relevant as inclusive as possible as possible yeah i guess overlap a bit with my previous answer is by learning mm -hmm. from lots of different industry experts and we have done that we've got an independent advisory board there's about 50 different academics from a variety of fields but we need more than that they're not sustainability experts they're, so we need to be engaging a lot more with forums like this listening we're already getting a lot of feedback on the ranking, some of it great, some of it not so great, of course, um, learning from that. And I think some of the points raised about making sure we're not neglecting the community engagement side of the work and making sure we're tracking real time progress is something we're going to have to go away and think about a bit more, not just always tracking outcomes. Um, that's what I would like to see us do yes. anyway. Yes, and I. I... That uh, definitely checks out with what uh, Kazo has said uh, as well, uh, and and Toko. Thank you all to uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Excuse me. Um, this was a very interesting discussion, um, and thank you to our audience members for your questions. I will now turn it over to Krishna and Hans. Followed the instructions. I muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much for such a fascinating, enlightening discussion. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, and I'm going to invite uh, Hans now to join us and say a few words. Hans, come on in.
You can't hear me? Are you able to hear me? We can hear Monica. you, Krishna. Again. Okay, thank okay. you very much. I was muted. Yeah. Thank you kindly, Krishna. Uh, Monica, thank you very much for your very thoughtful and creative questioning of the our three colleagues and guests. I personally hope to have the, the opportunity to get to, to know all three of them. And thank you, uh, gentlemen, very much for, for joining us and the diversity of perspectives. Uh, it's very interesting. I think this particular discussion uh, is very much relevant to our forthcoming global conference that we will be starting uh, November 28th hosting. I have the honor to co-chair it with um, some outstanding leaders, particularly in South Africa, and uh, we'll be in Cape Town. And one of the key things talking about sustainability and the linkage of students that was said is, is key. Increasingly, our engineering students are uh, participating in our global uh, conferences. And in particular, this time, we're working very diligently with not only colleagues uh, in, in Europe and, uh, and North America, uh, but very deeply with African colleagues that are, so we are facilitating opportunities for African students to interchange, to connect and build relationships with students outside of Africa and the mutually win-win opportunities for building hopefully permanent relationship for the years beyond. So I'm very, very excited uh, to just share that with you. Obviously, many of the, 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 the key theme that is touched on this particular conversation involves deans and faculty member and others and our corporate colleagues. And uh, uh, so I see this experience here this, this morning, this afternoon for you is a wonderful passage in terms of our experience. The, uh, the other final thing I simply want to say, I'm looking forward obviously to see, and the, the numbers are looking very, very excellent. We will also have uh, continuing discussions among many of the issues, including mental health issues and all that that are impacting our global community, is also bringing together women leaders as part of the series of Rising to the Top uh, that we have published several books and many of incredible outstanding leaders, women leaders that will be participating there. Without going into further details on this, uh, I, I'm very excited that this particular experience this morning is will be continued at, at a broader level, even in the next uh, 10 days in Cape Town. I look forward to see many of you. Thank you kindly, Krishna. Thank you and peace be with all of you. All right, thank you. I guess uh, all good things have to come to an end. And thank you. Uh, uh, chair for this session, Monica, extremely fantastic job. Thank you, Kodso. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, uh, Toko. Really appreciate this global audience enlightening us about the future of uh, how we should impact society through our education institutions and and uh, have a system that you know, that actually provides rankings for what we do. So thank you so much and happy uh, uh, happy day what <laughs> uh, everybody be happy be peaceful and be healthy okay thank you all goodbye thank you thank you for the invite bye -bye. nice to meet you all take care bye. take care